All right, let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Our gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this time that we can have this adult covenant instruction and pray that it will be a fruitful time of learning together, even as we look into church history and draw principles from your providence. So we commit ourselves to your care. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are continuing in our examination of biblical worship. You know, we've taken a look uh, quite extensively uh, on biblical theology and what the Bible teaches, uh, and also systematically when it concerns the worship of God's people. And so today's um, uh, topic will be a bit more historical as we examine how changes in ideas of God's sovereignty and salvation also affect uh, worship. So we'll look at revivalism and its influence on contemporary worship trends. You know, how we've gone from the beginning as we took a look at the definition of biblical worship, we saw the main uh, place of atonement in worship, we saw how Christ had fulfilled the Old Testament atonement so that God's people can now worship God without, in that sense, uh, the physical temple, without offering blood sacrifices, but all of that has been fulfilled in Christ. And so as Christians, New Testament Christians, we do what the priests of old did. When they entered into the temple, they came into uh, God's presence, they fellowship, they prayed, they sang. So for all Christians, we are now priests of God. So where once in the Old Testament, um, the worship of God was limited to a class of people, now, because we are in Christ, we are that class of people. All of us are priests, and we can do what the Old Testament priests had done in terms of pray, praise, fellowship, and be in the presence of God through his word. We also took a look at how there was a decline in that worship because of uh, medieval Christianity, because uh, they abandoned the principles of scripture, but how those principles were revived in the time of the Reformation, and they discovered or not discovered, but they saw being taught in the Bible the regulative principle of worship. So what we will do today is we will take a look firstly just at a summary of uh, the last lesson on the regulative principle very briefly. Then we'll take a look at uh, revivals and revivalism, especially the first and the second great awakening and how they affected uh, the practice of worship, and even taking a look at uh, why people and why churches and why the vast majority of Christendom today uh, have an understanding of worship that is different from the Reformation principles. So, <clears throat> the last time we came to talk about worship, we saw that there are two categories of worship and unless we understand that, uh, we will mix them together. So there is direct acts of worship, right? And those are regulated by the word of God. How we approach God in the formal public worship, right, is regulated. Yes, when it comes to our lives, how we live our lives in worship of God, whether you want to go and dance in Zumba, or whether you want to uh, do this or that, sleep or drink, you do all to the glory of God. So that's life worship. And then there's direct worship. One is regulated by the word of God, right? One is given by principles. And when you mix these two things together, uh, direct worship always suffers. So what we saw is that when it comes to worship, there are only certain elements uh, which are allowed. Those are the activities uh, of the worship of God which are revealed in Scripture by specific command, example, 
or by principle. So aside from these elements, there are no other elements in worship, such as you have word, whether it is preached, sung, read, right, uh, or, or seen in the sacraments, right, then you've got prayer, right, then you have fellowship, the sharing of the saints, uh, and then, of course, you have the breaking of bread or the sacrament. So apart from these elements, uh, there's no other element in worship. But how these elements are conducted is called the forms. So if you pray, well, what do you pray? Uh, what do you pray? You know, is it the Lord's Prayer? Is it mantras? Is it Muslim prayers? No, they're Christian prayers taught by the Word of God. If there's preaching of the Word, well, what is to be preached? And if they're singing, uh, what is to be sung? These are the forms of worship. But there are also ancillary things which are not uh, spelled out in the scriptures. These will be common to uh, human cultures. For example, if you come together for worship, uh, do you sit down? Do you stand up? Doesn't matter, right? The Bible does not specify every single thing, but because the worship of the New Testament church is also patterned after uh, the synagogue, people would sit, right? Uh, if you are rich enough to have nice plush seats, uh, go ahead, right? If not, you can sit on the floor. It doesn't make worship less or more. Uh, if you use hymnals or a projector or you memorize the words, these are all circumstantial. But of course, unfortunately, some can make the circumstantial have a spiritual meaning. So like a candle, if you light it for light so you can read, that's fine. But if you light a candle to symbolize the coming of the Holy Spirit, then that would be wrong. That would be forbidden. So circumstances are used to carry out the worship. Now, Terry Johnson has given, I like this summary as to what reformed worship should be according to the word. He says, Everything about our worship is to be simple. Nothing is to be clever. Nothing is to draw attention to the learning, the wisdom, the sophistication, the beauty, or the complexity of the medium. After all, we're told in the word, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, all right? So today, we take a look at revivals, revivalism, and how that, in one sense, changed the landscape and the understanding of direct worship. Now, we know that the Bible has recorded many occasions of revivals, and we also see it in history. And whenever there is a revival in Scripture, and in history, it always affects worship. It revives worship. You see, before revivals would take place, there would be periods of dead orthodoxy, coldness to the Lord, living in sin, right? There's heartless, uh, you know, uh, rote religious uh, disciplines without that uh, desire for God. So whenever there was a revival of God, then there will be a revival of worship. There will be worship in truth, right? Orthodoxy uh, would be promoted, uh, the elements and the form. So if you look at all the biblical revivals under Josiah or Hezekiah, whenever the word of God was brought back, right? All the idols were thrown away and all the people started to worship God uh, rightly with heart as well. So it was not just worshiping God in spirit, but also in truth. But the one thing that we have to acknowledge and we see is that revivalism, especially in latter revivals, uh, it spawned, it created a degeneration of worship, especially in the object. If you look at the biblical revivals, Whenever there was a revival, people turned to God. They worshiped God. They threw away their idols, right? They were faithful to God. But there were certain occasions in history, <coughs> excuse me, that caused people to turn away from God. And so you have to question, 
if these revivals were genuine. So in these revivals of sorts, uh, the, the object of praise was no longer God, right? And praise was not for God, but uh, praise was used uh, to uh, make a person feel good. Uh, it promoted emotionalism, subjectivism, right? And uh, instead of worship being used to praise God, worship would now be used as a tool of evangelism. Now, we don't deny the fact that God's people gathered together proclaiming their trust in God act as a beacon of light and it is a witness to people, but worship, praise, you know, these were always seen as something you give to God rather than something you use to attract men. And in latter revivals, that is basically what happened. And because that mentality was not dealt with, it affected almost every other uh, element of worship. It affected worship in general, where once worship was for God, right, done for God, now, you know, you consider how do we modify worship for man, right? So this affected the worship scene, especially in the 20th century and on to the 21st century. So that is why, you know, we are not trying to argue for a traditional worship. That would be a wrong concept to have, right? We are arguing for a biblical worship, and what we do see generally practiced in our congregation with the liturgy, with the elements, you know, it is historical, it is biblical, but it is very different, isn't it? from the kind of worship that you may see in other modern evangelical churches, right, with their, uh, now I, I want to be careful also how I use words because that would uh, uh, betray my bias, but as you know, and I've shared it often enough, I, I used to lead in worship in a charismatic church before, so I understand the ethos there, right? And, and so there's a different ethos uh, that, Reformed churches who hold on to uh, the regulative principle, uh, which are confessional, the ethos is very different from what you generally see nowadays because I would say one of the things is it stemmed from uh, uh, latter revivals that changed the understanding of worship. So uh, what is a revival? A history theolo uh, theologian, Professor Duncan Campbell, he said, what is revival? I do not mean a time of religious entertainment and crowds gathering to enjoy an evening of bright gospel singing. I do not mean sensational or spectacular advertising. In God's sense, revival, you do not need to spend money on advertising. I do not mean high pressure methods to get men to an inquiry room. In revival, every service is an inquiry room. The road and hillside become sacred spots to many when the winds of God blow. So what is revival? It is a going of God among his people, an awareness of God laying hold of the community. And so in revival, the fear of God lays hold upon the community, moving men, women, who until then had no concern for spiritual things to seek after God. So here we see that it is God word. The word of God plays a part it affects firstly the church, and then it affects the community. So we can see in scripture various re, uh, examples of revival. You have Jonah, when he entered Nineveh, the moment he entered and preached. Now Nineveh was a great city of three days journey. It took three days to get across. But the moment Jonah entered and he started preaching, right, uh, in how many days, you know, there will be judgment. This spread like wildfire, and people came to repentance, putting on sackcloth and fasting and pleading with God. So we see that it was through the word. Then similarly with Hezekiah. When he became a king, he brought revival because he honored the word of God and the temple was cleansed, the people started to worship God, 
right? All because of the word of God and faithfulness of this leader. Yet the same thing with Ezra and Nehemiah. When they came back, they preached the word of God. Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, they had the Levites read the word out loud with interpretation, and all of the people repented. They rebuilt the temple, the walls. So there was a faithfulness. And we also see this in Pentecost. When Peter and the 12, they were filled with the Spirit, they started to preach the word. And 3,000 on that day, they repented. And what did they do? Acts 2.42 tells us they came around the apostles' doctrine, prayer, fellowship, the breaking of bread, right? They worship God biblically because of a biblical revival, all right? So what are the characteristics of revival? Uh, from several authors like Ian Murray and Duncan Campbell, there's a general idea as you examine the scripture that before revival, there was widespread godlessness. And in each situation, right, in each of the situations, there was sin and ignorance. So the vehicle that brings revival is always the word of God. So when God's word is preached and understood, people respond. So we're not denying that in revivals that emotions are unimportant. They're, they are important, but godly affections which are born out of an understanding of the word. And there is repentance. There's an acknowledgement of sin. And so when there is revival, it will firstly affect God's people. People will be praying more. They'll be holy. They'll be reading the Bible. They'll be listening. And thereafter, there will always be a spillover into society where the community is affected by it, all right, and the gospel pervades. All right, so in every revival, you see in Hezekiah, the nation was revived. Now, not everyone was saved. Not everyone turned to God, but generally the nation became godlier. All right, and this was the case in every revival but what you do see in history is after one revival, there's a, you know, a widespread godliness, society's changed. Then after that, there's a decline. Then there's another revival, and then that happens again. So there's biblical affection as well as biblical worship. Now, I want to bring up two revivals in particular because I think they help our understanding, uh, and we see the contrast between the two. Now, how does this revival in the United States and in uh, uh, the UK affect us in Singapore? Well, for the simple fact is that we're English speaking. Uh, the theolo theology books that we read are from these two countries. Yes, they're more being translated out of Holland. Uh, but at the same time, the Dutch Reformed churches in America, they were also affected by the first as well as the second, and generally Christendom, and I say this because we all come from different backgrounds, especially in the past two years. So it's, a, it's good to understand how that has affected us, and uh, in that one sense, it wouldn't be wrong as to say, you know, almost every spurious and false things comes from the United States, uh, you know? I mean, in that one sense, it's almost true right, especially in terms of theology. Uh, so what happened is uh, in 1720, this revival that would affect the US, uh, the, uh, the Americas, uh, it was traced to a pastor called Theodore Frelinghuysen. Now, he was Dutch reformed, right? He had come all the way from Europe, and while in Europe, he had been affected by uh, German pietism. So if you had been here for several of the lectures before when we talked about um, challenges to the gospel and battle for the gospel in every age, uh, you would see that, you know, as Christendom goes forth, the gospel goes forth, people are saved. Then we become very comfortable in dead orthodoxy. Do this, don't do this, legalism this. Or, you know, my, my, my Christianity is characterized by, you know, how good I am by going to church, right? But in every age, God counters that 
falseness of religiosity with the gospel again, and then there is a revival. So for German Lutheranism, right, they were biblical orthodox, then they became dead orthodoxy. Then you had the pietism of uh, people like Jacob Spainer uh, or uh, Franke or uh, people like uh, Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. You know, so they studied the Bible and they saw there was more. They, 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 they loved the gospel and it affected their lives. So uh, Theodor Frelinghuysen came to pastor Dutch Reformed churches and he brought this fresh, uh, gospel-centered uh, understanding. Again, not just dead orthodoxy and right doctrines. And he started preaching. Now, at first, uh, his good old Dutch Reformed church, not interested. We only want to memorize the Heidelberg. You know? <laughs> we only want to you know, have this kind of thing. And, and what happened is they wanted to preserve this. They did not want to be challenged. But nevertheless, Frelinghuysen taught to affect the heart of the people. And this resulted also uh, in uh, ongoing work in the hearts of the people. There, there was no um, revival as of yet, right? Now, so this understanding of the gospel, this kind of preaching, right, spread from the Dutch Reformed churches uh, to the uh, Presbyterians. So there was another preacher by the name of William Tennant. Uh, he was the founder of Law College, which would eventually become uh, Princeton University. So as he heard, he picked up this fervor and he continued to preach. So these two men, Frelinghuysen and William Tennant, uh, they were from the Reformed tradition, you know, Dutch Reform and Presbyterians. They believed in Tulip, the sovereignty of God and all of this. And really their purpose was not to bring a revival of sorts, they just wanted to preach the word, to, to speak to the hearts of the people. They desired repentance. And um, they preached actually for 10 long years. It was very difficult because uh, really there was no revival, so to speak. They were tilling the ground, they were watering the ground. But after 10 years, revival broke out. And this, it came about through the preaching of Jonathan Edwards, who was a graduate of uh, William Tennant School uh, at Log College. And there, he was interested in preaching truth. So remember, revivals always started with truth, right? With the preaching of God's word. So he preached a series of sermons on justification by faith alone, and the result of that, now I don't think he preached anything different. Uh, what is said about him is uh, he read his sermons out. So. I don't think he was a very interesting speaker, right? Uh, uh, maybe that's just my idea from the things that I read. But he simply read it out, and as a result, there was widespread revival. And this moved among the American colonies. It went south from New England, and it also went west. Now, concurrently, there was a... Um, revival that was also happening in uh, the British Isles. So you had the founders of Methodism, John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, and they also came into contact with German pietism, all right? That the Christian faith has to do with repentance and love for God, right? And a desire for him, not just following your rules of your religion. And as a result, uh, revival spread through uh, England, and they also came to the Americas. They preached, and the result of their ministry was amazing. Thousands repented, and uh, they believed. Now, for the most part, all of these men were Calvinistic, uh, with the exception of John and Charles Wesley. Uh, we have to understand, though, their Arminianism is very, very different from the Arminian, Arminianism of uh, Jacob Arminius, right? So when we talk about Arminianism and the Arminianism of the Methodists, I know sometimes we're very enthusiastic as Reformed people, right? Always want to fight. But their Arminianism was of a more evangelical quality, right? 
this is something for us to understand. This is history. It's historical theology, right? So these were men, while evangelical Arminian in their understanding, yet they preach a solid doctrine, right? A, a, a solid gospel. And so as these men preach, so generally speaking, what is said of them is that Jonathan Edwards was the brain. Uh, George Whitfield was the passion and theology combined. Uh, John Wesley was the tireless evangelist who was enthusiastic, and Charles Wesley was the one who wrote the praises. All right, so if you want to look at these men, this is the general summary. But what we see is that in the first great awakening, the vehicle for revival was preaching, and they preached total depravity. All right, they focus on correct doctrine, like Jonathan Edwards spoke on justification. So, yes, although John and Charles Wesley, uh, they were evangelical Arminians, but yet there's the belief of God's sovereignty in the conversion of souls. So that is why if you, because we also as Reformed folk, we sing a lot of Charles Wesley hymns, and they are not unbiblical, right, in a lot of the things they say, they're chock full of rich biblical theology. And, and so it started with preaching and people converted. And at the same time, prayer was also involved. Right? The revival started in the prayer meeting and it continued in the prayer meeting. It became the, the focal point of the church. And as a result, we see that there was a purity in church and society. Now, I'm going to give some quotes from Jonathan Edwards. He said, there was scarcely a single person in the town, old or young, left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. Those who were wont to be the vainest and looses, and those who had been disposed to think and speak lightly of vital and experimental religion, were now generally subject to great awakening. So, all people who were eh, you know, religion, Jesus, you know, don't talk to me about him. All of them, generally, they were under the sway of this revival. And so, according to Edwards, the work of conversion was carried on in a most astonishing manner and increased more and more. Souls did, as it were, come by flocks to Jesus Christ. By the preaching, thousands came. He goes on to say, our young people, when they met, were wont to spend the time in talking of the excellency and dying love of Jesus Christ. What do young people talk about today? Uh, phone games. But then <laughs> they spoke about the excellency, the love of Christ, the way of salvation, the sovereign grace of God, the workings of God in the conversion of souls, and talked about the great things of God's word. And he goes on to say how it affected society so much that a loose and careless person could scarcely be found, right? It was as if everyone was touched by this concern. And if anyone was not touched by it, right, by the gospel, it would be a really weird thing. I mean, today, it's weird even in church, right, to have people who are very holy in conversation and wanting to pray. I mean, what would you do in your conversation downstairs after talking someone said, hey, come, let's pray now, right? Normally, what would we say? Oh, so bad. Okay, I pray for you when we go home. But then when you get home, you forget to pray, right? But here, everyone was spiritual, right? And what happened is that there was a revival in praise, you know, history attests that, you know, this great revival led to the heartfelt singing of psalms. And for, this is a historical development, for uh, not the first time, but the, it, it became more widespread uh, that there was now the writing and the singing of hymns. Right? Now, it was not just done by John Wesley and Charles Wesley, you know, it was also done uh, by reformed folk, right, like Philip Doddridge, uh, John Newton, and slightly before that, Isaac Watts, right? So, there was a revival of worship, right, with godly 
affections. But soon, as what happens usually after revival and uh, fidelity to God, then soon enough after one, two generations, it becomes dull again, dead orthodoxy. And after that, right, after two generations, you know what happens usually, uh, you know, uh, we older folks always think back and think of the good old days. So these people in their 70s and 80s, now they thought, oh, you know, it's so ungodly now. And, you know, uh, we had, you know, revivals back then. This was a common yearning. If you read the biography of Martin Lloyd-Jones, you also see he had this deep yearning uh, and was actually disappointed at the end of, the, of his life when he saw no revival. But so there was nostalgia Right? They were sentimental, and so they desired revival. And what happened during this time is we can see very clearly in the writings and the ongoings is that instead of resorting to preaching and to prayer, people started to resort to pragmatic ways of bringing and trying to bring about a revival. So, um, uh, so we, that's one part that affected the re Second Great Awakening. And another thing that was in the stream that affected the Second Great Awakening revival was during this time, um, the doctrine of Adventism became a lot more popular. The belief, whether you're post-mill or pre-mill in those days, oh, Jesus Christ is going to come. And, uh, you know, if the church would do all of her duty, then Jesus Christ will come sooner, right? And so this idea, and this is during the 1800s, is where all the major um, Adventist-like uh, cults and movements started, like the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, even Mormonism with the soon coming. And so all of this was fueling uh, these times, right? and um, the belief is if repentance and revival could be brought about by the church, then Jesus Christ would come. And so as a result, in terms of yearning for those times, this is where you had the large tent uh, camp revival uh, uh, being used. Right? Before, it was always in churches where the word was preached. Now it was in big tent revivals. Right? And History records that there was a lot of, as people came, as the music was played, you know, as the preaching was done, the way that it was done, there were a lot of emotional and bizarre occurrences, you know, such as people jerking, rolling, running, dancing, barking. Uh, these are historical things. So those of you who, who are thinking of the Toronto blessing, uh, that's not a new thing at all. It happened right back then. So... According to an author, he said, although the revivalists defended this emotionalism as a mighty work of God, more conservative clergymen condemned it as an unhealthy hysteria and advocated quieter methods for the salvation of souls. Ironically, on the very occasions where many souls were being noisily saved, others were being lost through intoxication and seduction. So history records also that at these big tent revival meetings, there's also drunkenness and people bringing alcohol. So these things did happen. Now, uh, R.L. Dabney, who was a Presbyterian, a minister of the Southern, of the Presbyterian Church of the U.S., which was the Southern Presbyterian Church, uh, he made this remark. He says, millions of souls are in hell because they were unable to distinguish the elevation of animal feelings from general, genuine religious affections. So there is a repentance that comes about through deep understanding of one's sins, right? And that's what you see in the revivals of the scripture. But you also have those which are brought about emotionally, right? Even Jesus spoke about that, didn't he? In the parable of the sower, there are some who come who receive the word gladly, but there's no root, right? They were never truly saved, and then they fall away. So according to Dabney, these, were, and he lived during those times, and, and he saw these things, that the conversions didn't always take root, and people continue. Now, one of the biggest influencers right, of the Second Great Awakening was Charles Finney. Uh, 
Yes, we do not deny that there were genuine conversions, but the ethos, right, the characteristics of the second great awakening was very different from the first. And it was different really in two ways, in the preaching and in the methodology. Right? And really the reason why it was, it, it came about because of the influence of Charles Finney. So he was Presbyterian, but uh, his theology was not Presbyterian because he uh, rejected key doctrines such as original sin, total depravity, you know, human inability. And, you know, he de delivered some lectures on revivals, and his main theme is that we want Christ to come, and we have to revive the church. And revivals can be engineered. Revivals are not just a work of God. And so in his writings, if you read them, he would argue that, ah, yeah, you know, people in the past, they didn't understand this. Revivals can be engineered. We can work up people's emotions, make them very close to God, and give their lives to Christ. And so he accused people of the past of this vast ignorance. Yes, in the past, people believed, as the Bible teaches, that revivals are sovereignly appointed, could not be produced by human arrangement. But Finney believed it was the church's duty to obtain them, and this is what he wrote. God has placed his spirit at your disposal. You see why you do not have a revival? It is only because you do not want one, because you are neither praying for it, nor feeling anxious about it, nor putting forth efforts for it. Efforts for it, yeah? And he said, if the church will do all her duty, the millennium may come in this country in three years. <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I could lose weight in three years. <laughs> you know, if the church would do all her duty, right, she would soon complete the triumph of religion in the world. This is the mindset. So he goes on to say, for a long time, it was supposed by the church that a revival was a miracle, an interposition of divine power. It is only within a few years that ministers generally have supposed revivals were to be promoted by the use of means. God has overthrown generally the theory that revivals are miracles, but you can bring them about. So William McLa uh, uh, McLaughlin he said the difference between Edwards, you know, you have the Edwards, the first uh, Great Awakening ethos, and yet the Finney ethos. He says the difference between the two is essentially the difference between a medieval and a modern temper. One saw God as the center of the universe, the other saw man as the center. One believed that revivals were prayed down, the other one believed that it could be worked up. Right? And so, because he denied total depravity, he said, can I? We can try and help people to, you know, to make a decision for Christ. So, the evangelist must not only preach Christ but, and, and tell sinners their duty, but he must appoint some outward action to assist the changing of the will. Now, one of his most popular sermons was this. I mean, Sinners bound to change their own hearts to us seems like, what? But to people in those days, that was exciting news that you could bring revival. So he had what he called his new measures to make a new heart. So he really, Charles Finney was the inventor of the altar call. I called upon any who would give their hearts to God to come forward and take a front seat, which he called the anxious seat. We insisted on immediate submission. I called upon them to kneel down and then and there commit themselves forever to the Lord. Furthermore, right, uh, I called on those only to kneel down who are willing to do what God required of them and what I presented to them. I called for those whose minds were made up to come forward, publicly renounce their sins and give themselves to Christ. Do we need to have a sinner's prayer to be saved? Uh, the answer is no, right? What do you need to do? You just believe and repent. You trust in Christ, right? You don't need to have a time of decision in that sense, right? This is what we believe, right? Uh, but a time of decision 
was so important to Charles Finney. And this is where, this is where you have now the use of worship, the use of worship as a means for conversion. So worship was a tool rather than an expression, a tool for salvation rather than an expression of the gratitude of salvation. So his use of songs were pragmatic. Now praise was now a means of evangelism to move sinners to make decisions. So worship was not primarily for God, but it was a tool for men to come. And he believed also that the church had no directive from God uh, for worship, but everything was to be used, right? Misquoting Paul, you know, by all means, save some. And so his new measures became that modern ethos and framework that we even see today in, you know, the vast majority of modern evangelicalism. Right, this idea of uh, a modern decision theology and uh, modern revivalism, having big tent meetings and so forth. So according to a minister, so there was a Presbyterian pastor uh, who went to inspect and was a reporter, and he wrote in his diary, he said, different hymns were sung at the same time with much repetition, each to their tune. The singing was very loud and accompanied by violent motions of the body. Several would pray at once, and all the while, the praying, singing, groaning, shouting were heard all around. The repetition of the hymns and choruses would drive the people into a frenzy, resulting in much crying, bowing, prostrating, and dedications for Christ. So, you know, we can see here we are all moved by emotions. And sometimes when we're moved by our emotions, we make certain decisions that may not necessarily be genuine religious decisions and affections for God, but it could be the mood that creates all of these things. So from this, a new style of worship praise emerged, and that was basically the gospel song, right? So this is when people like Fanny Crosby, uh, Lina Sandel, Philip Bliss, Ira Sankey, others produce music for revivals. And these were also testimonial uh, hymns, right? So they were more subjective, more from man rather than objectively praising God. And so a new tune, a new kind of musicology, uh, you know, uh, uh, form and poetic form emerged, and that was designated the gospel song where you have a verse, then you have a refrain, a chorus, right? So verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And it was generally faster in tempo than hymns. And so in the 19th century, in the Second Great Awakening, this gospel song genre spread rapidly, right? And also due in part to these gospel rallies. Because once people made a decision, they would go back to their churches and then they would bring back the appetite for these songs to these churches. And what also happened in these big tent meetings? Uh, choirs. So it was because of these big tent meetings that choirs now started to find their ways into other churches rather than the congregation worshiping God and being a choir, right, it was now a select representative of people who would sing in order to encourage, right? So praise was now meant to encourage the people rather than to be given to God, right? Now, having said that, I'm not saying that when we sing, we're not encouraged because we are, right? But it is the ethos the ethos between the first great and the second great awakening. So as we take a look at the roots of worship, there are many roots to modern worship. They're like tributaries flowing into a river. So modern worship can't be just traced to this idea of revivalism, but one of the large sources was the pragmatic approach. And this in turn led uh, to the influence in early Pentecostal leaders. If you trace the history, right, those churches which were uh, uh, old side and new side 
in Reformed theology, when they came together and the old side won out the confessionalism, the Bible-believing aspects, the doctrine with heartfelt worship, they continued in a path of orthodoxy, Reformed orthodoxy, for those churches that were gravitating more towards the new means and the emotionalism, you know, a lot of them eventually became free will churches, right? Like free will Baptists and, and Wesleyan, Nazarene holiness churches. And in turn, this group of churches is where you, you, you eventually end up with the early Pentecostalists, right? So what they took as a foundation, they, they, they propagated it more in their churches. So uh, when the Pentecostal movement was started, uh, historians commented that uh, all these good old hymns, they were now still being sung, but they were set to new accompanying music. In that one sense, nothing wrong with that, but with choruses and you know the gospel style, merging it with that, right? And, and so, um, they also commented how in their drive for religious experience and energy and excitement, right, they now thought of new ways about music, sought to take, you know, what was the old hymnody in order to make it more engaging and exciting. So one of the persons who did this was uh, Amy Semple McPherson. So if you want to know more about her, and her various scandals. Uh, you can uh, Google her, but what is significant is that she was the founder of the Four Square Pentecostal Church, still in existence today, a very large Pentecostal church. And in a biography of her, it was recorded how she preached and how she did the work of ministry. You know, especially in worship, she threw out the slow songs, right? the dirges and threats of hell, but she replaced them with jazz hymns and promises of glory. So you see there's an ethos. Now, it doesn't mean that we only sing the sad stuff and the judgment stuff, right? As New Testament Christians, we sing, we're joyful in all of our songs to sing about the glories of Christ. And that's why we sing the Psalms, you know, a lot of the emotions of the Psalms are too scary for hymn writers to write about, right? They are deep, they are dark, and it shows the emotions that the Lord Jesus went through, you know, his great anger against sin. So it is not wrong to be emotional in a biblical way, right? But here, there was a different ethos. And so she used jazz as a medium in her hymns, and this was a norm, an, uh, a, a, a norm in the early Pentecostal movement. And according to a historian, he said, without jazz, the Pentecostal movement could never have made the rapid inroads into the hearts of men and women as it did. We were the first. So this was a Pentecostal uh, historian. He said, we were the first, as far as I know, to introduce the accelerated tempo into gospel singing. And of course, Amy McPherson used uh, extensively a lot of other tools, all right? So one of the things that she did that she was very skillful at apparently was uh, hymn manipulation. So once, you know, they were singing the, the hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, all right? And so there are various stanzas there. She made people sing, you know, uh, all the stanzas, uh, the first stanza, then they'll have the middle age sing one stanza. Then when it came to a specific verse that speaks about old age, she had the old people sing. And then, you know, the, the effect was phenomenal when you hear, you know, a handful of old people singing, you know, and when death's cold sullen stream shall over me roll, that effect brings goose pimples and goose bumps to you. Right? So it has an effect. A mood was created. Now, I'm not against the fact that we should be, have godly affections, but one that comes from the heart rather than one that is sensually reproduced. She was an innovator at preaching, so she was one of the first who used the illustrated sermon. She used props. So in warning people, right, well, the Old Testament got trumpet, what? So use foghorn, right? 
So she used such props and she had skits and dramatic stories. And so this is the ethos today. Do whatever it takes to get the message across rather than follow the elements and follow the forms that are found in God's word. And she used dramatic lighting as well. So there are other streams as well. Dancing really came about through the ministry of Oral Roberts and you know the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s, the use of popular genre without modification. Now we all know, you know, um, Louis Bourgeois in writing of the Genevan Psalter, or was it the Strasbourg, the tunes, uh, he used the contemporary genre, but modified. Luther also used the contemporary genre, but modified. But now uh, it was the, the using of the popular genre uh, en masse. There was no distinguishing between sacred and profane. So Robert Godfrey, um, a seminary professor, theologian, he said, what originated as a natural expression of life, theology, and piety of the Pentecostal movement in the 1920s has become generalized far beyond Pentecostal circles. These origins should give us pause to ask, if this kind of music is good for Pentecostal churches, is it good for non-Pentecostal churches? You see, very often theology affects worship, but worship will modify one's theology as well. So summary is, revivals are from God, they're sent down, revivals are not worked up. Charles Finney's new measures were meant to work up revival, and this basically changed the fundamentals of worship. Rather than being for God, it was now for man, right? Rather than it being uh, praises to worship, it was now a tool to reach out, and rather than worshiping a ruling, an already ruling king, it was a means to bring down a king, right, for his second coming. So this pragmatic, sensual drive of the Pentecostal movement has affected, you know, contemporary worship trends. And I guess I don't have to speak too much about that. You know, we see such, such sensuality to the point where, you know, visitors to our church often say, ah, so dull, -a. <laughs> you know, uh, because there's a lack of understanding of what worship is. All right, I'm going to end here. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Pastor, for the session. May I know uh, Charles Finney's uh, background was a Presbyterian, right? Just I mentioned. So how come, uh, if you don't mind me asking, he wasn't excommunicated by the Presbyterian Church? Because he's, he has changed so entirely, you know, the worship, the, 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 all, the, all those, uh, you know. Thank you. I, I can't say whether he was or was not. I can't remember. Um, I mean, if he was, that's a good thing, you know, but I don't think he was. I guess, you know, when you've got loose polity, when you see fruits, People are drawn to fruits rather than uh, doctrine and persuasion. So perhaps that could be something. Hi, Pastor. Thank you for your uh, lesson. I think, I'm not sure if it's out of topic, but could you add a bit of um, color, especially here in Singapore? Because I know some pastors were impacted by Billy Graham's crusades, and that ties into their idea of what revival is. I think some pastors in Singapore has tried to recreate that so-called revival. So Billy Graham, as well as Jerry Falwell, both of them big names in American evangelism, they have credited uh, Finney as one of their heroes. So it is not a surprising thing, you know, that when people see such fruit and desire such fruit using such means that people try and recreate it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I guess it's an acknowledgement, you know, that you see that stream feeding into even, you know, churches here. Yeah. I mean, that one sense, people can be saved in Billy Graham crusade, truly saved, and disagree with those things eventually anyway. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>
So the question is, the Bible says we should sing with the spirit and understanding, and does not the spirit there denote understanding? Um, I think when you speak about, let's go back to spirit and in truth. So in spirit, one of the things it, it refers to in the context of what Jesus meant was that there will be no physicality. The temple, the mountain, you know, is anywhere where God's people are gathered, you know, uh, in his spirit, that is worship. So we are talking about how worship is something that is spiritual. And in the context of what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians, speaking to the Corinthian Christians with all of their sensuality, he was saying that worship is spiritual. It is not something that is sensual in this sense, you know, uh, with their speaking all together in tongues and praying all together and, you know, singing all together. So that is, I would say, the primary meaning based on context. But secondly, we see in the breadth of Scripture, you know, when Scripture speaks about singing, it must be joyful. It must have emotions. It must have religious affections. But we must see the difference between religious affections and carnal sensuality. So I think when you take a look at um, the, 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 the two uh, awakenings, revivals, you see the different ethos between them, generally speaking. It doesn't mean that there were no excesses in the first great awakening, there were. Yeah. Any other questions? Pastor, just now you mentioned that uh, it's important to raise our spiritual emotions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just want to understand, uh, do you have a suggestion on how we do it? In the past, I think I, we, I, I know people of hearing Maratana singers, a uh, praise series, and even hear, uh, listen to hymns and even psalms. And I was wondering whether hearing uh, worldly music, whether is it, uh, in this spiritual realm. Yeah. How do we stir up religious affections? I mean, the Bible speaks of it in different ways. The Puritans said, uh, spoke about it in different ways. I think it is through the preaching of the Word of God that stirs. Uh, it is also in the sacraments when we understand it. I think we commune with God uh, and we perform our spiritual disciplines with devotion, always being mindful that uh, uh, we need to be sensitive to God and let Him lead. So there's that openness uh, to God leading, the desire for Him. And in that one sense, if we're truly walking with God, the Bible already tells us in, in, uh, uh, in Romans 8, doesn't it, that uh, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so walking with affection for God is something that should be natural, that we should stir. So in the singing of hymns and psalms and so forth, we ought to mean what we say. We ought to prepare ourselves. You know, I suppose that's why in our church bulletin is sent on uh, Friday or Saturday so that we know what's being sung, that we can prepare ourselves. All right, this is to promote religious affection. Um, so that is completely different from listening to worldly music that stirs the emotions. Is that okay? Uh, sure, why not? Yeah, you know, provided they're not sinful emotions. You know, but that's for a different purpose altogether, right? Yeah, that's why you got band music, National Day. Supposed to stir up something. Yeah. A any other questions? If not, we should end. Okay, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for your providence in history and the various fruits of certain events. Help us, O oh Lord, as we look at Scripture to see the revivals therein the changes in society and the church and in your kingdom, the heartfelt desire for greater holiness.
and how there was fidelity in worship. Help us, O Lord, as we consider our own worship, that we may sing with the spirit and with understanding, thinking upon Christ and stirring our hearts for him. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.